praise God and thank God for today. Thank God for today. We are celebrating our freedom today. Our freedom. And as Christians, we enjoy that freedom every day because we are free from sin, free from the bonds of the enemy. But I want to take you back just a little bit to let us reflect upon how we obtain this freedom and what it's all about. See, we celebrate the signing of a Declaration of Independence when the uh, settlers conquered or not conquered but defended themselves successfully against the oppression of the British but it didn't start there you see this country was founded upon Christian beliefs the people who came here first did not come here to tame this land or to sell this land they came here looking for freedom that's why they came they came for the freedom to function in this our Bible. You see, they were oppressed and ridiculed and suffered at the hands of the religious establishment. See, there were, so these people, they were not Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, and Catholics, all that. They were called Puritans because they wanted to worship or serve the pure God and the pure word of God. So their first stop was, I believe, in France. And they ran into the same situation that they were running from, established religion. So then they decided to come this way to America. It was not America at that time. They just came to a free land and they were able here to establish themselves as free men to worship the God of heaven the way they chose to worship him. And that's how they entered the Puritans. Pure religion. Freedom from oppression. And so many people began to come and to settle here. Then the British again decided, well, since all of our people were there, that's our country also. So they began to establish the government here the same way it was there. And you know the rest of the story. They wanted taxes and they wanted the rules and the regulations. And the, the settlers tried with everything that they could to sell this thing through peaceful transaction. They negotiated, they pleaded, they, they petitioned, they did all of the things that was right in the eyes of the law to no avail and it had to come to force, violence, so to speak, or war as we know it. And they overcame, outnumbered, outnumbered, they overcame, which takes us again to the scripture because when we see the battles that were fought in the Bible when the Israelites first left Egypt, if you recall, once they crossed the Red Sea, they, they met up with the Amorites and they refused to let them go and they declared war against them. And these were all just slaves. They had all the knowledge in making bricks and herd and cattle and all that. They had no knowledge of fighting or, or weaponry, but they won the battle, outnumbered. And as we continue through scripture, we see Gideon, for example, fighting the Midianites, 300 men against more than they could count, but they succeeded. And then we come to um, Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20. Jehoshaphat outnumbered by the Amorites and the, the uh, Jebusites and many other nations came against him. And 
the Bible says that when he prayed to the Lord, he didn't even have to fight the battle. The Lord said, just go out there and I'll show you the glory of God. So they went out and they won the battle without even firing a shot or without swinging a sword. So I'm saying that in the history of our world and in the history that is in our Bible, we see that God always prevailed. So this country was destined to be a free nation. But again, as you can see, we're coming to that point now where we'll be oppressed again and things are getting completely out of hand. So we know that there is something to come, something to come. But our faith and trust in God and this being a Christian nation, we understand that we will overcome because through God all things are possible. Amen. Through God all things are possible and God never failed. So that's just a little something to say that we are celebrating the, the fighting part of the freedom. But we need to look just a little farther back to the Puritans. They came here for that freedom, but the freedom was to worship God and to live according to the Bible. So that is the, how this country began. So we see we've always been a nation seeking freedom. So that's all we know. That's who we are, a freedom seeking nation. So oppression will never be able to overcome us we will always succeed because we have God. Amen? Amen. 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 And we're going to read this morning from the book of Romans. And I'm going to read from chapter 6, beginning at the top, verse 1. And it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, I want to qualify this because, you see, just starting out there, it may not make a lot of sense because it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, the reason that this question was put forth is because Paul had made a statement that may have confused some of the people who heard that. They heard him say that where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. So they were didn't want them to be confused by saying, hey, we should keep sinning so that we can get more grace. Let's sin so we can get grace because wherever sin abounds, grace abounds more. So to get more grace, let's keep on sinning. But Paul comes back and straightens that out so that nobody is, is misinterpreting what he said. He says, God forbid, Lord, no. Don't sin because if you're dead to sin, then you shouldn't want to live in it anymore. So you see, he's saying that we can take sin out of our lives by dying to it, by cutting it off, by stopping it. Now watch as it goes on. He says, verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, ever so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. And from now on, we should not serve sin. But he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, 
being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death has no dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he lived unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now we said all of that just to say this. Stop sinning. Stop sinning. All of that was said just to get you to stop sinning, it says. You have participated in Jesus' death, and then you yourself has died to sin, so you're free to resist it. If that makes sense to you, you are free to resist sin. Because you have died to it. When you said, I do to Christ, you cut off all sin in your life. And you begin to live for Christ. So you have died to sin. And now you're free to resist it. And don't believe or fall into that desperate lie of Satan saying that just because you're human, you have to sin. Well, you know, we're humans and uh, we're going to sin. We just have to. That's a lie from the devil. You don't have to sin. Jesus told the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, he said, go and sin no more. Now, see, if she couldn't go and sin no more, he would not have told her that. He wouldn't have told her to go and sin no more if she couldn't do it. Because God is a loving, faithful God. He won't tell you to do something that you can't do. Amen. And then when he gave us the model prayer, some of us call it the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew 6, 13, it says that uh, and to deliver us from evil and to take us away from the temptation. Take us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil is the way it goes. But it says, just get us out of that. And that is the devil. Remember? The devil. The tempter. The devil. The evil one. So he's saying to take us out of that. And in scripture, throughout the scripture of the Bible, he is convincing us or encouraging us to stay away from evil. To stay away from evil. That, that is his encouragement to us. And he wants us to understand. Understand that he has equipped us with the power and or the authority over all the power of the enemy. And I some of you say, well, that's not true. That's not true. Well, if you believe that, that's between you and him. That's between you and him, if you believe that. But I want to take you to a, a, a statement in Luke that, that will, will verify or prop up what I just said. In, in Luke chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils. He gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal sickness. And you're going to say again, because we always go to the native side. We say, but that was just for the uh, disciples. That wasn't for us. See, and I knew you were going to say that. So I went 
to Mark in Mark chapter 16 verse 16 he says he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils Amen. now are you a believer are you a believer if you are a believer then that means you you can cast out devils and heal sickness because you are a believer you see it was not just for the apostles because you forgot that God is no respect of person. So what he has done for one, he will do for all. And he says that these signs shall follow them that believe. So it's not just for one section of people. It's for them that believe. And whoever believes, that's the sign that will follow you. You have the power and authority to cast out doubt. Amen. That's just what it says. That you have that power and that authority. And we know that we Christians go through life running from the devil. And talking about how the devil is inflicting heartache and pain and, and discontent upon us. We have the authority and the power over him. But we don't know it. We don't use it. So therefore, he keeps us on the run. When it is, should be him that's on the run. Because it says that we can resist him. We can resist him. Instead of us saying, oh, he, he's just worried me out and I don't know what to do. Well, this morning, today, I'm going to tell you, here's what to do. Submit, surrender, or just give up to God and say, stop, devil. That's it. See how simple that is? Just say stop. Because we're relying on the word of God. James says in James 4, 7, what did he say? He said, submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And I love the definition of flee. Flee says to get away from by running. And that's a, to get away from by running. That's what flee means. The devil will get away from you by running. And then he gives us another out in um, Ephesians 4, 27. He says... Don't give place to the devil. Just don't give place to the devil. The devil cannot come around and get into your business unless you let him. Don't give place to the devil. I'm talking about our ability and our authority over the enemy. It has been granted to us and God is not going to chase the enemy away. Read your book and tell me where you find that somebody said, Jesus, come and get the devil. And, the de and Jesus came and got the devil. He says, no, I have given you power and authority over the power of the enemy. Go. So see, you have to do it. You have to do it. That, that is breathtaking. That is phenomenal to know that God entrusts us with the power that he had. Why? Because as we were studying in our Bible study on Wednesday night, we came to the conclusion that God, God is the head and Jesus is sitting at his right hand orchestrating that. But when he left the earth, he said, all power has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Now you go. You go. He's going to sit at the right hand of the Father and intercede for you and make sure that the things that you go to do will be done because all power in heaven and earth has been given to him and he has made you power of attorney. He's given you that authority. Thank you, Lord. 
But we have to operate in it. We have to act upon what God has given us. We have to stop running from the devil and stand on the principles and the promises of God and use what God has given us. Yes. If I gave you a hundred dollar bill, you wouldn't just put it in your pocket and say, yeah, I got it, but I ain't never going to give it that. I'm going to keep this. God has given us that power and authority and we just put it in our back pocket and we walk around with it and we say it all the time. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, what are you doing? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God is all powerful and all knowing, and He'll take care of all of my needs. But what do you need? Everything, man. You see, we have to use what God has given us for it to be beneficial to us. As long as we got it, it's good. But if we're not using it, it's just like not having it. So he says, I have given you power over the enemy. I'm giving you power over the enemy. You can cast him out. You couldn't cast him out if he was stronger than you. You see, he has to be weaker than you for you to cast him out. He can't get into your business unless you let him into your business. That is what the word tells us, that the enemy comes not but for to kill, steal, and destroy. So he's not coming to benefit you with anything. Every time he shows up, it is to cause a disaster or destruction. And every chance he gets, he'll take you out. Because he don't care. That's what he come for. That's what he does. And that's all that he does. So what God has given us, he has given us the wherewithal to take care of ourselves by handling it for ourselves. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That therefore is therefore a purpose. Submit yourself to Christ so that you don't have to fight the devil. Amen. Submit yourself to Jesus. You better come and take care of your property. <laughs> when you submit yourself to Christ, you have given yourself to Him. You have did what the song said. You have surrendered all. You are no longer in charge. You see? You are no longer in charge. You got a house. Your house is not in charge. You are. So you do what everything it needs. But you don't let nobody come in there and put you out and take charge of it. There's a lot of demolition men running around here in Bullhead City. How many of them would you let just come in your house and start tearing it up? You say, no, get out of here. Wait, wait a minute. I'm a demolition man. This is what I do. I destroy things. But not here you don't because this is my house. It is the same distance with the devil. The devil comes not but for to kill, steal, and to destroy. When he shows up at your place, to destroy your health, to destroy your happiness, to steal your joy. You can say, not here you don't, because this is mine. Get out of here. Yeah. I own this. That is what God is saying here. All power has been given to me. And he called his disciples and he gave them power and authority over the enemy and said, go now. Preach the gospel and heal the sick. Not on your power, but on my power and on my authority. But it says that we have to submit to him and we have to operate in the will of God. Watch this. Watch this. I want to go to 1 John to the epistle John 1 John and I want to look at 
chapter 2 and verse 15. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. What he is telling us here is that we are in the world, but not of the world. And if we choose the world, then we pass away. We fall into that destructive category. But if we choose God, then we get eternal life. We will last forever. Thank you, Lord. And he's speaking in that world translation. He is speaking of the morally evil systems of the world that is against God. That's what he's talking about. The morally evil systems that is against God. When we adopt those, then we lose our relationship with God. He who is a friend of the world is an enemy with God. So that is what he's telling us. That we need to stay away from the evil systems of the world. Amen. And I brought you to bear with me on this one. I'm, I'm, I'm winding for it down. But I need you to bear with me. And because this is really big. This is really a big one. And, and this is where we lose it. This is where we lose it. In in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Beginning at verse 14. He says here. Remember, this is really big. This is really big. Trips us up every day. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Don't be equally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what goodwill has Christ with the evilness of Baal? Or what part had he that believeth with an unbeliever? And what agreement had the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be ye holy. It's this uh, Be ye holy, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Saith the Lord Almighty. Thank you. you cannot compromise. That's what he said. You cannot compromise. You must have standards. And you must take a stand. That's what that scripture said. We miss that all the time because we want to be pleasant. We want to be liked. We want people not to look at us and say, well, he's this or he's different and he, we want them to say he's a nice guy. So, but the Bible is telling we cannot compromise. You cannot agree 
What an unbeliever if you will believe him. You're not going to agree. It's his light. What, what connection does light have with darkness? And you know what connection that is. Absolutely none. When you turn on the light, the darkness goes away. You turn the light off, the darkness comes back. They do not coexist. And this is what he said. We cannot be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We have to take a stand. We have to understand that if it is wrong to God, then it has to be wrong to us. Yeah. That, that is what he said here. You know, your tax man come to you and say, well, you know, I can get you uh, extra thousand dollars. Take this deduction right here. And they can't prove one way or the other. You have to object. You have to say, no, I did not spend money over there, so I can't take that deduction. You have to object. This is, this is what we do in darkness. It's what counts more in our character and our integrity than all of the things that we do in the open. When nobody is looking, what you do counts more than what you do when the world sees you. Right. Because it goes to your character. When you go into the voting booth, when you go into the voting booth and you vote for the guy who promotes same-sex marriage, homosexuality, and abortion. And you come out and you say, well, a woman's got a right to choose, and I'm heterosexual with a wife and children, so that ain't my business. I don't care. Yes, you are now condoning, promoting, and supporting homosexuality, same-sex marriage, and abortion. I don't care what you think about it. And then you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, preacher. I don't take my religion or my Christianity into the voting book. Well, how do you take it off? And if you can take it off for that, what else do you take it off for? Amen. And if you're taking it off and putting it on, guess what? You ain't got it. Amen. <laughs> This is what this is saying, that we cannot compromise. We must have standards and we must take a stand. Amen. Because when we condone or join ourselves with things that are unrighteous, it makes us unrighteous. Whatever is an abomination to God, it has to be an abomination to you. Because he just told you, he says, I will live in them and walk with them. And I will be their God and they will be my people. And I will be their father and they will be my sons and my daughters. It means that if we are going to follow him, we have to be like him. The proudest moment of a father's life is when somebody points out his son and says, he looks just like you. That's not important in the kingdom of God. We have to act just like him because we were created in his image and in his likeness. And the only way that you can see the God in us is by what we do. Right. I'm saved. I'm saved. That we must take a stand because you are who you are and it is the truth that makes you free yeah. and when you don't have the truth you don't have freedom because you are bound with something that you're hiding from <laughs> this is one of the reasons why Zacchaeus <laughs> In Luke 19, Zacchaeus is one of my favorite Bible characters, and he doesn't do anything but be who he is. He's a crook, and he knows he's a crook, and he doesn't care who knows he's a crook. When Jesus shows up, he runs right up to him and takes him to his house because Jesus said that's where he needed to go. So Zacchaeus took him. He didn't care what Jesus saw in his house. And we read throughout the scripture where it says that Christ has, was, what did it say? Birds have nests, foxes have holes. 
But the Son of God had nowhere to lay his head because nobody would take him home to spend the night with him. That's why he didn't have nowhere to lay his head. Because nobody would take him home to spend the night with him. Because his righteousness convicted people so that they couldn't let him come in to their homes and change their life. But Zacchaeus, he didn't care. I said we are who we are and we can't take off who we are and put it back on. The book asks the question, a profound question, can a leper change his spots? Can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin? You are who you are and that's what you operate in. Whoever you are, if you are without a wife, you operate without a wife. If you have a wife, you operate with a wife. You operate in whatever you are. You don't change your motives just because of your position or because of where you are. I'm saying to us this morning that if we are to be followers of Christ, then we have to walk in his footsteps. Christ can't be going down Hancock and you going down 95. But oh, I'm on with Jesus. No, you have to be where he is and doing what he's doing. That is all it is. And whether you believe it or not, or like it or not, that's just the way it is. And then when you get to the end, Jesus says that a lot of us, a lot of us are going to run up to him and say in the end times, Matthew chapter 7, look around in verse 23 and see what he says there. Many of us is going to run up to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I preach good words and do wonderful things in your name? I cast out devils in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Huh? See, we look good to everybody around us. But what we did when we were alone did not correspond with the will of God. That's what I'm talking about. Taking a stand and what you do in secret must be just as as beautiful as if you did it in a crowd of a million people. Amen. That's what God expects of us and that's what God is asking us to do. Take a stand. Don't compromise. And stop sinning. Stop sinning. Stay away from evil. And if you want to, to see a good example of that, go to Job. Go to Job and see what the devil has to say about it. The devil says, you've placed a hedge of protection around him. I can't get to him. He's got a hedge of protection around him. But then it says that because Job was an upright man who was perfect and who feared God and eschewed evil. You see, he stayed away from evil. And he reverenced God. And he was upright and truthful. That is how you can become my servant, Bill. Rather than, oh, that's the old Bill over there. My servant, Bill. My servant, John. My servant, Susie. When you become God's servant, He's your work. He knows you're doing good. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what we long to hear. That's what we long to hear. I'm going now to the back of the room. And what I want to do is I want everybody to wiggle, twist, however you have to do it. But I want us all to be holding hands when we end up. If you can stand, it'll make it easier. And that way, that way. If you don't, 
if you can't stand that's okay then those who can, come, some of you young people come back here and fill this gap <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah 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 And if you wondered why or what we're doing, it's we're going to follow what the Word says. In the book of Genesis, in chapter 11, God says, when all the people were on one accord, there is nothing that they can't do. Yes. yes. When all the people are on one accord, there is nothing that they can't do. So we're now all joined hands. We're going to be on one accord because in Matthew 18, around 19 somewhere, he says, when we come together as touching anything in his name, that he would do it. He would do it. And then he says, again in 19, he says that whatever we bound on earth, he would bind in heaven. So this morning we're coming together to bind Satan. Yeah. We're binding Satan and all of his activity, Father. We're binding him from our lives. We're binding him from our finances. We're binding him from our health. We're binding him from anything, Father, that has to do with us. Yes. And so you, in your word, it says, whatever we bound on earth, you would bound in heaven. And we stand on that promise and we believe that promise. And that's what we come to do this morning. And you said again in your word that whatever we loose on earth, you would loose in heaven. So we loose the spirit of God this morning. We loose the spirit of God in our hearts. We loose the spirit of God upon our lives. We loose release the spirit of God upon our families, upon our health, upon everything that has anything to do with us. And we ask in the name of Jesus, Father, that as we come to you as one, joined together, believing and trusting in your word, that we would see and feel your presence. We would see and feel the results of what we're doing here this morning because we read the scripture all the time and we see all of the great things that was done in the book and we don't see any of those things that being done so we have to do what they did to get what they got yeah. and so father we stand this morning on your promises and on your principles and we receive all that you have to offer and we thank you in the name of jesus we come expecting and whatever it is that we expect and father we truly believe that we will receive in the matchless name of jesus amen, amen. amen.